Hey, Stackers, good news. Because I was in Seattle last week, I didn't have enough time to tell you about our fantastic giveaway that OG and I have going on right now. Get this. You can bring a friend with you here in just a few weeks. July 15th is when you'll fly to Detroit. We'll bring you from any place in the lower 48 states. Stay at a hotel here a couple nights. You get to hang out with OG and, uh, dare I say it, even Doug. How amazing will that be? But the big reason we're bringing you to town is so you can see the new Playing With Fire documentary. And if you're familiar at all with uh, financial documentaries, this is a big boy. So here's how you sign up. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash fire movie. That'll give you all the details. You fly in Monday. Tuesday, you'll have lunch with as many of the Detroit area financial influencers as we can round up including the Stacky Benjamins team and Scott Rickens, the uh, co-creator and star of the Playing With Fire documentary. And then you'll attend the screening. We'll also have a discussion afterwards, maybe have a little uh, post-party fun. And then on Wednesday, you'll fly you home. Anywhere in the lower 48 states. That's the deal, guys. Apologies to everybody outside the lower 48, but that's the best we're going to be able to do. You have until Thursday at noon, tomorrow at noon, stackybenjamins.com forward slash fire movie. All right, on with the show. You know, I don't understand this podcasting thing. How come you boys can't have those keg parties and chase the girls like all the other nice boys do? Y'all are nerds. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. <laughs> I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today is a great day for transportation. The bicycle was invented today in 1819, and the first Le Mans race was held. Oh, and today, we're transporting you into your financial future with an episode where we tackle your letters. But that's not all. We'll fly through a Haven Lifeline call, rumble past a headline or two, and sail right through to several incredibly hilarious dad jokes and ski into my heartwarming trivia. And now, two guys who are strapped in and ready to ride out the rest of the week. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. We got the seatbelts on here at the card table, and we are ready to go for Wednesday. Hey, everybody, just so you know which voice is which, I'm Joe Salcija, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the table from me, the guy who's not the fake OG on Twitter, he is the real OG. OG. It's a hell of an open. Yeah. I love it. What's up? Start weak and get weaker. That's our strategy. That's, that's the strategy. Yeah. Right? Have you seen that? it up. Have you seen that running meme? That's like, okay, you're no. to do. we're going to start slow and then we're going to ease into slower. Nice. Yes. We got a great show today because we are back on the letters train. We still Tr- trying to clear the decks. Yeah, we don't. We don't take letters anymore. We take voicemails and um, we just really want to get through this. And uh, this is also we only have one more show in this eight week period, OG. So I thought what a better way to. Uh, end the week with a roundtable on Friday. And today we'll we'll take care of letters. And also today we get to talk about health a little bit because we got to say thanks to MetPro for supporting Stacky Benjamins for a complimentary metabolic profiling assessment and a 30-minute consultation with a MetPro expert. You'll head to metpro.co slash SB. Angelo, when he was here from MetPro, some, some good radio. Hopefully we'll get him back fairly soon. But right now we got a couple headlines I want to dive into. We got kind of the yin and yang of headlines and I want to get OG's take on these. So let's get started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from the street.com. How to become a day trader. Yes. (laughs) Clickbait. Let's hear it. Well, here's what I thought. I found this piece really interesting because of the fact, well, we'll get into it, but uh, I did find this super interesting. It's written by Brian O'Connell. Brian writes, becoming a day trader isn't for everyone. 
It takes equal parts discipline, cash flow, patience, and the willingness to take risk that most stock market investors likely won't absorb. On the other side of the coin, the rewards of becoming a day trader are numerous. You're your own boss. There's ample money to be made, and you're learning about a valuable wealth creation tool called passive income, which allows your investments to grow in value while you sleep or while you press on with other matters of your life. That, that sentence is a lie. There is nothing passive about day trading. Not in the least bit. That's the the word trade is a verb. It's yeah. not a it's not a it's not a anyways, okay. Know this, however, the most successful day traders go into the venture with their eyes open and don't expect day trading to be a get rich quick scenario. Consequently, you're gonna have to work hard to hone your craft, grow accustomed to the realities of losing money on a regular basis, and live with the fact that you're taking financial risk. Most other investors do not. If that sounds like a good deal to you, then read on and let's demystify the realities of the day trader. Uh, there's eight steps, Brian says. He says it's a multi-layer process, but it's highly doable if you have the passion and discipline. Uh, the most conventional way of becoming a day trader is to ease into it and learn from experience one trade at a time. Prepare for that experience by knowing what you're in for as a day trader. And that means defining it and learning it just as you would any professional occupation. <laughs> Prepare yourself, take $200 out of your bank account, light it on fire, and see how you feel. As the day in the life of the day trader. I want to define this first before we talk about it. By and large, he writes, a day trader is an individual who trades stocks during the day when the stock market's open. In virtually all cases, a day trader aims to buy and sell a stock in the same day with the goal of making a small profit. And people may wonder why we don't talk about day trading. It's because day trading is not investing as much as it's betting on what's going to happen in the news and with the broader market with individual positions on an individual day. But I like this idea, OG, that he talks about. And I think there are some similarities, even though you and I are not fans of day trading. Listen to the preparation that he talks about already in this. Like I, I think a lot of investors just take money, they hear about an index fund that everybody else is using, they throw their money into the index fund, but they're not ready emotionally. They don't have a game plan. They don't have a system around how they're going to trade. Even if you're in an exchange traded fund, you got to think about the other end of the stick, right? When you're going to pull it out, we see none of that. That's what I like about this article is it spends a lot of time and we'll get into it a little bit, a lot of time talking about getting ready for the emotions and the systems of being successful as an investor. Well, the emotions, perhaps the systems, you know, we talk about making sure that having your life on autopilot from a financial standpoint, automating things to make your saving and investing easier to do because then you don't have to think about it, I think is really important. On the emotional side, the single greatest risk to your investment portfolio is your ability to withstand the ups and downs that happen. And everybody who has been investing in the last decade all has the same refrain, which is, oh, yeah, I'm fine. When it goes down, I'm okay. When it goes down, I'm okay. But nobody in the last decade has had their investment portfolio go down 50 or 60% or 40%. Maybe that's what I mean by systems is that when you're picking your funds, there's a methodology by which you're picking your funds. It's not just taking the thing that somebody else is using. It's using the tool that's going to get you to the goal and then understanding it. Because the reason why people blow up their strategy, OG, you know why it is. They don't understand what they have and they don't understand how it's going to react. And so when the investment takes an action and you don't get how that works, you're more likely to sell at the wrong time. Yeah. Or why it's doing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, he goes through these. Number one, take inventory of your trading skills as a day mm -hmm. trader, obviously, you're going to look at what your skills are. But How fast can you push the button? <laughs> like It's like, and go. As an individual, though, I think it's important when you look at your investing life to go, where are my strengths and where are my weaknesses? You know, don't try to get great at everything all at once, but maybe lay one brick a day. Say, you know what? I don't know this. I don't know how this works. I don't, and, and maybe you won't use that stuff in the future, but being curious and learning more about how the markets work are going to make it better if there's a bumpy ride, like as an example, let's say that you're on a plane and things get bumpy. Oh, here we go. <laughs> and there's some turbulence and the wind pushes you in one direction. You must course correct. And I promised you we were going to bring that up as often as possible. That's okay. 
Yeah. Once you know what's going on in the cockpit, OG. As long as you can check your five most important dials. You're much more likely to do that well. I, I check the, the uh, P the, OG dial right there. The the, uh, the goer upper or downer button. Yes. You have one that says that, don't you? Go upper? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Make more air between me and ground. And you press that. Okay. They're more up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, number two, are you fluent in financial knowledge? We kind of touched on that one. Number three, can you handle substantial financial risk? There's a measure that I used to, there's two measures I used to like to go through when we go to Morningstar. Back when I was a financial planner, we'd look at two different ones. One was called beta and the other one was called standard deviation. And standard deviation showed how a fund would react in most markets and it would give you the swing. Standard deviation is the swing that you can expect from that fund in just normal sailing waters, right? And so I would tell people, I'd say, we expect this fund to do between this and this. It'll go outside of that sometimes, but this fund in a normal course of activity could do negative 26. What do you think about that? We'd have that discussion ahead of time. I felt like it was like the pilot telling me ahead of time that there was going to be turbulence. I love doing this. It's so much better when I know you hate it. It's okay. Paybacks eventually. Trust me. Number four, face the realities of the business. You know, there's that great phrase and I used it uh, just the other day. Face reality the way it is, not the way you wish it were. Number five, have adequate trading dollars together to start. We're not going to talk about trading and day trading, but even as an investor, how often have you met somebody that had no money together? They had a huge goal. And what was their strategy? Take a mm. ton of risk, right? Yeah. Take yeah. Just, just a ton of risk. Number six, run tests on your trades before you start spending real money. I don't really, I don't know that I like this one. I've seen studies that show that some of these, these uh, play money platforms where you can go invest ahead of time with no money, you make decisions differently when real money's on the table. Heck yeah, you do. Well, I like it to kind of get to know the levers and stuff. There is nothing like having real money on the table. Well, and when it comes to like actual investing and actual financial planning, which is what we're hoping that people take out of this and not day trading, the <laughs> the exercise of backtesting your strategy or doing fake money or whatever is pretty futile because you're going, well, how did my investment portfolio perform if I did this consistently over the last 40 years? Oh, turns out I'm a gazillionaire. Correct. You don't have to like, you know, you don't have to backtest that. You don't have to you know, model it out. It's just fact. Well, and also sometimes if you do that, you're going to do it with a strategy that's really high right now. And reversion to the mean is a real thing. So testing a strategy and go, wow, I would have more of my money. If I have more of my money in the thing, it's up really high right now. That section of the market. I should just put all my money in that section of the market instead of diversifying. There used to be a tool. It was kind of a game and somebody may know it. It's it's been a while since I've seen it, but it was a uh, exercise where it would, you would, you'd start with, let's say a hundred thousand dollars, right? It would like chart your return over a period of time. Like it would just, it was like a, like a video, right? And it would show it going up and down and up more and down a whole bunch and so on and so forth. And you could hit your space bar or whatever. And that would, cause you to buy or sell at that period of time. So you could say, okay, I want to buy now. I want to sell now. I want to buy now, sell now, whatever. And then it would track all that, like kind of as it was happening, almost like your day trading minute by minute, but it was taking like a long period of time, you know, 20 years or something. Anyways, at the end of it, it would say, here's what you actually got by doing those decisions. And then here's what you would have gotten if you had just gone into a coma for that period of time. It was actually pretty interesting and eye-opening wow. exercise because you could never do it right. Like yeah. even if you were like, I'll just wait for it to go down. And as soon as it's down, then I'm gonna like I'm gonna back the truck up and I'm gonna buy a whole bunch. Cause as soon as you do that, it would like go down more. <laughs> and then you know what I mean? Like it was but it was real time. It was real a real period of time in history with the S P or whatever it was or one stock or something. And I can't remember the name of the cool exercise it was. So if anybody knows they can send it in. But it was kind of fun. You know, one of my favorite books on trading, by the way, if you go read this book, you will probably not have a lot of fun with it. So take this as a grain of salt. This is not a book recommendation. It's called Trading Rules. And it is uh, it is an older book, out of print. So good luck finding it. Well, you actually can. I, I looked it up maybe a year ago and you could find it used on Amazon but through our Powell's link. You could find it all over the place. 
but the book goes through this, this uh, professional traders goes through his rules. And one of his main rules are don't pretend, you know, where the market's going tomorrow. And this is a dude who's a pro who did it every day. He's like, do your homework, like the price that it's at now and make your decision based on current reality. He said, because you have to get over the idea that you have any clue where the market's going tomorrow. And by the way, once you take that away, it makes you more fearful, which is actually how you should be. You should be more fearful over short periods of time, and you should be much more comfortable with the trade over a long period of time. Okay. They're really cool rules. It is written in the most academic, boring way ever, which is why I don't, gen- I don't generally recommend it. But the rules are very solid if you want to spend the 450 on the used book to just catch those. Our second headline comes to us from MIT Age Lab. This is, I, I got lucky. I got to go to a conference at MIT that was put on uh, part. You told me you were teaching at MIT. I didn't say it was teaching. I was presenting. Just, I was you attending. Were... I was watching other presenters, uh-huh. including Rick Edelman, who was there. We, uh, Gene Chatsky was there. Michelle Singletary from the Washington Post was there. But I was in the audience. They were some of the presenters. But the MIT... A- so you tell everybody now that you went to MIT? Yes, for a day. Except I don't say for a day. I just say, yeah, I went to MIT. What makes you so qualified? <laughs> Dude, I went to MIT. <laughs> really? When did you graduate? Well, I was on the premises. There's a dispute going on right now with that turns out i was like a credit short or something anyway a few credits short (laughs) turns out it was four years and an acceptance letter away (laughs) (laughs) 200 grand (laughs) from graduating but the age lab at mit doing great work this was actually it's a white paper distributed by hartford funds but it's written by dr Uh, joseph coughlin over at at mit and i actually got to meet him fascinating individual But he talks about the future of advice and he talks about what they talk about the age lab, how aging is changing everything, right? Especially in the certified financial planner world, OG, you know as much or more than most people what a problem aging is when it comes to money management. A lot of simulators, Monte Carlo simulators, a lot of people don't even know what that is a lot of longevity simulators, not showing people living as long as they probably will. And the chance of you running out of money is becoming greater and greater. They talk about uh, how life is changing for older people. They're much more technology savvy. The family dynamic is changing. The family, the piece says, has traditionally provided the physical and social support necessary to age well. However, the families change, leaving an uncertain future for many older people. Fertilities drop precipitously nationwide, where the parents of the baby boomers had 3.9 children on average. Baby boomers had only 1.9. Today, one-fifth of American women don't have children, compared to one in 10 in the 70s. Consequently, there are simply fewer children to provide care and support for aging parents. Even those that do have kids cannot be sure their adult children will find economic opportunity anywhere near home. Many parents in middle age urge their children to seek opportunity in distant cities and states only to find themselves without family nearby as they grow older. It continues to go into that. Then they talk about the jobs of longevity and making the, making the transition, managing your health and well-being, providing care, living at home. Those are all interesting. And I'll link to this whole white paper, but the part I want to talk about is the changing world of advice. And it starts off where we would expect it to with transaction-based value. And the piece talks about how transactional advisors provide relatively traditional services that focus on investment and financial security. Primary client engagement is made typically with one member of the household. Discussions are centered on the number needed to ensure a secure retirement. Interactions certainly include planning, but are typically guided by algorithms of what an aging family might need in retirement, housing and healthcare costs, as an example. The value of the advisor client relationship rests on investment growth. Interactions between the advisor and client are limited and are primarily about transactions undertaken to achieve a quantified goal. He talks then about how if strategies go wrong, and obviously with things changing, people aging, family leaving the area, things more often than ever could go wrong and how transactional advisors for that reason, not just for the whole commission-based stuff, that kind of thing makes that a difficult model. So then we've gone on to 
what you and I talk about a lot, a planning base value, right? He says the planning advisor expands his or her relationship with the individual client beyond investment strategy. A concerted effort is made to include the partner or spouse as a planning unit instead of just one member of the family. While quantified investment objectives remain a priority, the planning advisor initiates a broader discussion about planning objectives such as where a couple might wish to live, how they plan to act, what they're going to do, what their lifestyle is. That then would include their budget, their estate plan, their health care, all these things. So it becomes a much more holistic approach. But Dr. Coughlin says then that isn't even enough because of the problems of aging One partner may pass away well before the other. Like instead of this idea of a retirement, you know, you can divide your life into quarters now. And even if you're financially independent, things may change broadly during this 30, 40, 50 years that we used to call retirement. So he talks now about longevity solutions. And this is really the first time that I've that I've heard about this. I mean, I've heard of intergenerational planning, but really, OG, this this is what it is big time is planning for longevity using a multi-generational approach. And you become an advisor, not just for one set of people, but for the whole greater family because of all the issues that are going to come up. The longevity solutions advisor enjoys the greatest degree of client intimacy and has the deepest relationship with his and her clients and their families. The longevity solutions proposition also offers the widest range of discussions and product solutions For example, client seminars engage entire families on topics that address the broader context of living longer, like education and professional development across the lifespan, or the future treatment cost of managing chronic disease. Adult children may be engaged as an integral part of the relationship and where appropriate serve to facilitate discussions of what the client and his or her family may want in old age, such as where to live and how. The Longevity Solutions Advisor focuses and facilitates more in-depth discussions about health and well-being. Such discussions are critical to providing insight to the client, but also facilitates conversations that may reveal issues such as diabetes diagnosis, which will have profound implications on the cost of healthcare in advanced age. The piece goes on further down. Such longevity solution advisors address a wide range of lifelong issues. They're better able to engage clients across their life stages. Rather than focusing only on the future, the longevity solutions advisor becomes relevant immediately And that usefulness only increases over time. For instance, such an advisor may connect adult children in their 40s to geriatric care managers and elder care services to care for aging parents or provide career transition services for 50-something clients who want to continue to work but also want to change. In short, the longevity solutions advisor's value is that he or she provides financial security along with a map of what older age may present, which can be enlisted to help and how to pay for it all. I found that. Absolutely fascinating. I might have lost a few people there, but these. Um, me too. <laughs> or me included, maybe. This idea of uh, planning for longevity over multiple generations and being more of a family advisor, not just for like, like I have a friend who works for the Ford family and helps the Ford family manage their fortune, right? They have advisors because they're uber wealthy that everybody calls. You call Bob. But this is now available for the mass affluent or for the average person out there. Well, yes. And I think that the lesson here is that the the example of retirement or financial independence time that you experience through the eyes of other people, which is basically how we gauge everything in our life is how our parents did it or how our grandparents did it, is changing dramatically. And it's changing faster. So the rate of change is also changing. So, you know, we talk about like the hockey stick going up in terms of, you know, the growth rate of something. It's the same thing with longevity and the impact to that and all of the secondary and tertiary effects of what happens if you live to be 120. It's one of my more favorite exercises to do personally is start writing out, here's all the people in my life, right? So here's me, my spouse, my kids, you know, my parents, my wife's parents, my grandparents have passed away, but hers are, she still has some alive and start adding 10 year blocks of time. And then you start writing out like where all these people are and you go, Oh my gosh, when I'm 60, my kids will be 30. They will have kids that are 
five, my parents will be 75. You know what I mean? And you start kind of playing with how this all changes. Think about, think about it on this note. Somebody's 120 in the family. Kids are 95 or 90 years old. Their kids might be 70. Their kids are, in, are, are 45. I mean, the 45 year old might have could have three generations of people. You can see how, you know, generational wealth on one side, but generational poverty on the other, you're not taking care of mom and dad anymore. You're not even taking care of grandma and grandpa anymore. You could be taking care of great, great grandpa and great grandpa and grandpa and mom. You could be taking care of a bunch of people in the family. I mean, the whole, the, the cycle of poverty as people live longer becomes even worse. Which is why the timeframes that we construct for ourselves around things like retirement or financial independence, I think you have to really change how you view that. I've spent a lot of time and energy over the last uh, several decades trying to convince people that being fully invested for and throughout their retirement is the right thing to do. But part of that is this reason. You know, when you're 65, you look at the people who are ahead of you, your parents who retired at 65 and now are older at 85, and you think about their lifestyle and that sort of thing, you go, well, my time horizon is 20 years. My time horizon is 30 years. It's not. Your time horizon could be 40 or 50 years. And P.S., you may also be responsible for, for people ahead or behind you, like you yeah. were talking about. Your time horizon, which most of us focus on, might not even be the core issue in your retirement plan based on all this. It could be your grandparents that are the biggest issue in your time horizon. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's an interesting exercise for sure. Yeah, it, well, and a worthwhile one. And it's funny, when you've got some of the biggest brains in the country, OG, at MIT, that are working on this, you know that we're looking at the future here. This is a problem um, that's coming quickly and, and a, a problem in our lifetime and one that our parents didn't face. Yeah, largely no. That's right. I think our takeaways here are number one, that uh, planning maybe just isn't about you, that looking at it from an intergenerational standpoint is pretty good. Go back last week to Cameron Huddleston's appearance here on the show, talking to mom and dad about money. I think that's just a start. But this idea of intergenerational planning, I think, is a much, much, much bigger idea and, and much more holistic. The uh, second thing, while we discourage being <laughs> a day trader, you may or may not want to try that. Your results may vary. Understanding your stuff and emotionally what that roller coaster ride is going to be like, like a day trader, I think that's a pretty good idea. Well, today we've got your letters. And man, are we across the board here in the mailbag? Once again, we don't take letters anymore. We're just finishing these out because we were getting way, way, way behind. If you've got a question for us, though, head to the uh, Haven Lifeline, stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail. See how many we can get through today. The first one is going to be about Roth IRAs. OG, we're going to start off there. It's your favorite topic. I've got three questions. Number one, do you think I should invest in a backdoor Roth IRA or put that yes. money toward my mortgage principal? Let's talk about let's talk about the pieces. I'm 52. I'd like to retire in three to five years. I have one and a half million dollars in retirement accounts, about two hundred thousand equity in my house. I have three hundred and sixty thousand dollars left on my mortgage. I'm still contributing the max to my 401k and match out my HSA as well. I have a six month emergency fund, no other debt except my mortgage. I'm a highly compensated employee, so I don't qualify for a separate Roth. No kids and I'm single. I'd like to pay down my principal, but I also want to set myself up for what could be considered early retirement. So backdoor Roth IRA or put that money toward the mortgage. Well, think about it in the context of the goal. So you have three years or five years before you retire. Under neither of those circumstances is the house paid off. You know, because the most you can contribute is seven thousand a year. If you work for another three years or five years, you know, you're talking between twenty and forty thousand dollars of Roth IRA contributions or twenty or forty thousand dollars of principal pay down. Do either one of those materially change the outcome of your plan for retirement? 
And my guess for that is that it probably doesn't, you know, because if you have in five years from now, your mortgage balance is $280,000 instead of 200 or 320, let's say, guess what? The payment's still the same. It doesn't affect your cash flow in retirement. You still have to still have to make still make the payment. You just pay it for a little bit less period of time at that point. So because of that, I would probably err on the side of adding money to the investment portfolio because it'll give you greater flexibility down the line as that money continues to compound. It's not going to move the needle one way or the other a great deal in the grand scheme of things because you've kind of got this time frame, this this self-imposed constraint where against a million and a half dollar investment portfolio, which in and of itself is going to grow quite a bit through your contributions and Lord willing, a uh, nice market tailwind. Eh, that's a plain reference <laughs> for the next few years. You know, it's not like you're going to make or break your retirement or financial independence decision on having accumulated an extra $20,000 at this point. But I don't think you should spend it foolishly. So uh, this is one of those toss-up things of w- whatever makes you happier. If it makes you happier to pay down the debt and you'd like to see the balance go down a little bit, so be it. If you want to accumulate a little bit more money over the next few years, that's fine too. But either way, it's not going to affect your financial independence plan. Here's the thing that I wonder about. I wonder how that $1.5 million versus the amount of money you're going to want to live on in your early retirement how long that's going to last. So I would do that calculation first, because if you're going to be more aggressive, you want to leave that money invested and add to it to beef up that and then have that pay the uh, mortgage over time. But listen, if you can afford to be conservative, OG, if you think based on your expenses that that's going to be enough money, then I like the idea of taking the cash flow, lowering the amount, going into investments and uh, socking that away. But I would run that analysis first. I'd use plenty of calculators out there that will help you with that and tell you whether you can afford to be that conservative. Uh, The second question, do you pay taxes on a backdoor Roth? So I'd have to take after-tax dollars and get taxed on them again by doing backdoor IRA route. Um, I guess you're misinterpreting how to do that. It's, so there's a couple of rules. Firstly, the non-deductible IRA contribution to Roth conversion, which is what you're talking about here, works very well as long as you don't have other outside IRA accounts. If you have other outside IRA accounts, it gets muddied pretty quickly. But in general speaking terms, if you contribute $6,000 or $7,000 to your non-deductible IRA, and then you do a conversion shortly thereafter, you will pay taxes on the gain between your contribution amount and the conversion amount, which if it's been a month or two, shouldn't probably be that much, frankly. So the taxes due would be pretty pretty light, but could be something unless you put it in like a specific stock or something that doubled over a month or something, then you pay taxes on the whole thing, but um, on the whole gain, I should say. But otherwise, the taxes are pretty minimal. And just to make sure, because I also think that Anonymous here is uh, might be confused about how it works, OG. When you're talking about the backdoor, you're talking about new money going in, right? Taking the money and putting it. That's right. Not that current money that's not that current one and a half million dollars and shifting that over to a Roth. But, but, but backdoor, uh, by definition, would be new money. Uh, third question is... My brokerage firm manages my current IRA. They have me in 25% bonds, 75% stocks. Is that the right mix for my age, age 52? The answer is, I don't think your age has anything to do with it. Well, you know, we just talked about the time horizon and life expectancy and things like that. We think about the perspective of time based on the things, the milestones that we have. So we think like, oh, my time horizon is, you know, I want to retire in five years. Well, what's that got to do with anything. You need money in five years. I got that part, but you also need money in 45 years from now, probably. So if you need money in 45 years from now and 44 years from now and 43 years from now and 42 years from now and 41 years from now, and you keep going, the vast majority of that money should be invested for those time horizons. And then if you layer on top of that decisions like, well, but maybe my heirs or my kids or grandkids or whatever, I want to influence their decision-making or be able to help them financially. Now you start thinking about their time horizons. You know, it can get pretty, pretty long in a hurry. In all seriousness, though, I don't have a perspective on whether or not your allocation is correct because I don't know anything about you besides time, you know, your yeah. age. The, the reality is, is that you are your greatest obstacle. 
to financial success. And with a 75% stock portfolio, that means that you have to be okay with one year in five or six, a third of that going away. And if you look at your investment account today and it's a million and a half dollars and you kind of fast forward 12 months from now and you say, if this statement that I got from my brokerage company says 999,000, it's just yawn another day and you don't care, then I would say you're invested correctly. If at 999,000, you freak out and put all your money in cash or God forbid, you know, fixed income or something like that, then you're not in the right allocation. You know, so there's there's different levers to pull there. And just because, you know, 75, 25 or 80, 20 or 60, 40 or 50, 50 or 100 and zero, that doesn't mean anything until you put it in the context of what really might happen. You're talking about standard deviation. And that's where I think you need to spend some time is say, well, what's the real likelihood of outcome here over the next period of time? And now over 40 years, I think it's going up. Right. I mean, I think it's safe to say that over your lifetime, that portfolio goes up. But what does it do over the next 12 months? We don't know. So you have to kind of think through how you would feel, what you would do if a third of your money went away. I do want to put one final point on this. You mentioned blah, blah, blah. My brokerage company manages my IRA. Before that, we were talking about backdoor IRAs, which now become virtually impossible if you have an IRA. So all the previous mentioned stuff, questions one and two, don't apply if you have an IRA. Because now when you try to do a backdoor, you have to aggregate all of your IRAs for the tax calculation. You have to aggregate all your pre-tax IRAs. Yes. You don't get to pick which, which IRA dollars you want to convert. The IRS looks at it and says, hey, you have a million dollars of pre-tax money and 6000 of after-tax money. And you go, well, I want to only convert the 6000 after-tax. The IRS goes, no, you don't get to pick that. We're going to convert proportionately. If you want to convert $6,000, you're converting six-tenths of a percent of your overall IRA, of which six-tenths of a percent is pre-tax and the other you know, 99.4%, I guess, is pre-tax. So you get hit with a really gigantic tax bill. Yeah. A lot of stuff to unpack for this person. Yeah, there really is. And age, so many people get locked into this age thing. It's when you're going to access the dollar. When you talk about the long-term OG versus the next 12 months, when you access that dollar becomes vitally important because different asset classes do better under different uh, timeframes. Our next question, see how we transition partway there from IRAs over to investments. We're going to stay with investments as we talk to Dave from Canada. Dave says, I'm a huge fan of your show, not for the financial knowledge, but for the entertainment. I always look forward to new episodes every single day. Thank you for what you do. I'm from Vancouver. My wife and I are in our early 40s and have kids. Except for our mortgage, we currently don't have any debt. We have sufficient emergency funds, cover six to eight months living expenses, the foundation you've been talking about. We live below our means and we'll stay away from debt. We've been trying to simplify our investment accounts. Here's what we have. Current has an RRSP. That's a registered retirement savings plan. That's similar to a 401k in the United States. Contributed to get the maximum match by the company. My wife works for a company in the private sector that is a traditional defined benefit pension. My wife and I each have an RRSP account outside of work, which is similar to an IRA. Uh, we also have a tax-free savings account that's just like a Roth IRA. I love the, I love by the way the uh, translation here. Oh, gee, the Canadian to U.S. translation. We have an RRSP that's similar to an IRA. We have a TFSA that's similar to a Roth. I think you have to just say A at the end of everything. Okay, there. We have a registered education savings plan for our three kids. RESP similar to CT. Uh, yes, ECT. Uh, Tell us what it means to me. Similar to your 529. That's a total of seven accounts between my wife and I. I find it too many and it makes it a little bit more work to monitor and maintain. Except for my company sponsored RRSP, we've started to move our accounts to a self-directed brokerage and we just invest in three index ETFs like the Vanguard Canada All Cap ETF, iShares World Accept Canada ETF, the Vanguard Universal Bond Index ETF. These are some of the lowest cost exchange traded funds that are offered here. Uh, Dave's got two questions. OG, first one is, what are your thoughts about having the same three funds across all of our accounts? 
except for the company sponsored RRSP where we're offered a limited selection. What do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of having the same three funds across all accounts? Is this keeping our portfolio simple or is it redundant? During rebalancing, we plan to rebalance maybe two to three accounts at a time, but taking into account the overall allocation, that's to minimize trading costs. What do you think, man? Three funds to do all the heavy lifting? Well, it's uh, better than a sharp stick in the eye. And in terms of simplicity, it's probably the easiest that you can find. I'll reserve comments around the actual asset allocation because he didn't ask about it. But I think that when you create your asset allocation, you can also take an extra half a step to, to look at the taxation that comes from each account and then decide what the best product should go into that type of taxation account, so to speak, to make it as more as efficient as possible. So for example, you might look at something here in the Roth example and say, well, I know that the rest for the rest of my life and for the rest of everyone else's lives that this money impacts, it's going to be tax-free forever. Therefore, I might want to get the highest potential return here. If there's a thing that I have that has a higher volatility, that has a higher expected return in my overall portfolio, then maybe it goes in this place because it's 100% tax-free forever. If I put in $10,000 and it turns into $10 million, over my lifetime, then I never pay taxes on that versus, you know, you mentioned the fixed income position where that's not going to grow as quickly. Maybe you don't want that in your tax-free account, but I will say that the overriding philosophy is asset allocation. So you're not going to use the tax tail to wag the dog, so to speak. It's just an extra, an extra lever that you can pull if the allocation is correct already. His second question, our overall portfolio allocation is, I would say, balanced to growth, 65% equity, 35% fixed income. We're much wiser with our finances and investments since we started investing 10 or so years ago. We're also more comfortable with our finances. And with the help of my wife's company pension, I think we can stretch our investment horizon a little bit so we can afford to take a little more risk. We're thinking of switching our allocation to growth, say 70% equity, 30% fixed income. How do you suggest we make the switch? Is it better to convert the 5% as a lump sum or dollar cost average it for a period of a few months or wait for the next buying opportunity for making the switch? And then he says, yikes, market timing. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thanks, uh, Dave, for those questions. He says, send my regard to mom. Uh, regards to Len, too. He's so hilarious. I enjoy the show more when he's around. We all enjoy the show more when Len Penso's around on Fridays. Oh, gee. So what do you think? Uh, make that move at once or make it over time? Well, the short answer is just make it at once. If your goals have changed and your time frames have changed and now your portfolio has to change, you should change it. There's no sense in trying to delay it because what are you trying to do? You are trying to hedge your bet right? That's the only thing that you're trying to do. You're saying, well, maybe if I'm wrong, I won't feel so bad about my decision. If in six months from now, the market's a little lower, at least I bought one sixth of my extra money. Again, you're, you're talking about like a relatively small overall percentage change from one to the other. Should I go from 60 to 70% stock? Should I go from 70 to 80? Because my time frame changed slightly. We just beat that horse to death over the last 50 minutes around, you know, your time frames are much longer than you actually think. So the reality is, is that if your goals have changed and your time frames have changed, then your portfolio should change. You should change it. Be done with it. Back to the trading rules we talked about, Dave. Give up the fact that you're going to know what the real opportunity is. Market starts going down. People don't know that it's an opportunity. I mean, there's no way to know. There is well, the, the reality. So, I mean, just think of it this way. If you knew so strongly that there were buying opportunities, where were you on Christmas Eve? Right. When the market was down almost 20% in three months in the United States anyway, what were you doing? What, why didn't you dump all your money in then? Like that was the buying opportunity. Well, the reason you didn't is because it sucked and you just got your face kicked in for two straight days if you're paying attention to it. And if you had any cursory knowledge of how things were going, you were convinced as well as everyone else that, yeah, this is the beginning of the end. Again, it just was, you know, somebody was tweeting something they shouldn't, something was happening that nobody predicted, and therefore the world was collapsing. And just as fast as that happened was as fast as it turned around literally the next day, right? So the day after Christmas or Boxing Day, 
Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Canadian How pull there. That? Good work. So on Boxing Day, it just turned on a dime. And you could see it. It was just amazing. And then you get to the end of April. Just This is a contemporary time. You get to the end of April. People are like, oh, this is the most amazing market ever. And you get to the end of May. No joke. No joke. Four straight months of the market going up. End of May, market's down 7%. Not many people, but some actually emailed and said, hey, what's going on? My portfolio's down like five grand this month. Yeah. Can you believe that? I'm like, well, it's a, you know, okay. It's all emotions. It is, 100%. You know what? My throat's a little parched. Yours has got to be. You've been going crazy, man. You've been crazy today. Doug's waiting in the wings. Let's turn over the chair to Doug now for our trivia. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome to the bicycle built for two of this show, My Trivia. Why bicycle built for two? Well, because it's the part of the show where I help you turn the giant sprocket that's going to get you to pedal those little brain synapses. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying here, folks. Anyway, here's today's nugget to celebrate cycling. The Tour de France kicks off July 6th in Belgium. And before Lance Armstrong, there was another great on the world cycling stage. And this man was born on this day back in 1961. This guy won the Tour de France three times and partly because of Armstrong's doping scandal. But also partly because there wasn't much of a cycling culture in the USA when he won. Many consider him to be the greatest cyclist in American history. Who am I talking about? I'll be back with the answer after I check the air in Joe's mom's bike tires. Well, as a leader, you understand it's not just about the number of hours in a day. It's about productivity. The same goes for health and wellness. It's not fundamentally about what to eat or how to train, although those are pretty important pieces. What MetPro is focused on is time management working smarter and establishing a game plan specific to your goals and lifestyle needs. MetPro has a unique and important point of view on what true net worth really means. Their experience helping CEOs and industry leaders meet unique challenges provides them with remarkable insight for anyone wanting to see a greater ROI in life. I love the idea of ROI in life. I think too many people are optimizing things that are not life ROI. We're optimizing today's ROI or ROI toward a non-specific goal, but with better health. I think that's your ROI right there. MetPro's team of experts will guide you through a personalized nutrition and fitness strategy and educate you on how your body responds to macro and micro adjustments to your fitness, nutrition, and daily routine. MetPro's proprietary science, technology, and techniques have helped thousands of executives and business leaders learn how to optimally manage their health and achieve their associated performance goals, regardless of how much they travel or how demanding their schedule is. Your metabolism is constantly changing and adapting to your environment, Without identifying a starting point, it's hard to know the right strategy. So metabolic profiling is this process that allows MetPro to get a baseline to see exactly how your body is responding against a very specific set of variables. It's so interesting as og has gone through the program, just seeing him learn what to eat, learn how his body responds, learn exactly where he is. And what's neat is... It's not just about something you could buy in a book. It's all about him and the way his body acts and what his body does as he eats different foods, as he works out a certain way. It's all about his individual metabolism. So for a complimentary metabolic profiling assessment and a 30-minute consultation with a MetPro expert, go to metpro.co forward slash SB. That's metpro dot co forward slash sb hey there trivia nerds i'm joe's mom's neighbor doug spinning today's trivia on the anniversary of the birth of america's greatest two-wheeled human-powered invention the bicycle here was the question 
what American cyclist who won the Tour de France three times was born on this day in 1961? The answer? It was, of course, the great Greg LeMond. Not only did LeMond win the Tour those times, but he also won the Road Race World Championships twice. 30 years ago, this year, LeMond staged what many says is the greatest comeback in Tour de France history, winning the race by only eight seconds. It's one of the few times the event came down to the last day, let alone the last minute of the month-long race. See, now you got something to talk about around the water cooler. You're welcome. See ya. Hey, let's roll with Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Brian in our Facebook group said SpongeBob SquarePants and his wife's amazing capacity to forgive. OG, your wife has an amazing capacity to forgive. Yeah, I mean, forgive the kids. I don't do anything wrong ever. Oh, man. Yes. Fake news there, folks. Fake news. Their answer is your loved ones and your time, not SpongeBob SquarePants, but it's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven now to grab your free quote. You can see how much it costs. You'll be surprised because their prices are super affordable. They're also unlike some companies that you've never heard of. Uh, they're backed by a more than 160 year old company called Mass Mutual and their application's simple. It's all online. They've streamlined everything so that you can focus on what's important. Speaking of, it's important for us right now to throw out the lifeline to Pete. Hey, Pete. Hi, John and OJ. First time, long time. I had a question about my 401k. I invested about 7500 this year through my 401k at work, and my work has since ended. So I was wondering what options I have to invest uh, with tax benefits if I don't have a job that offers a 401k anymore. And I had also maxed out my Roth IRA through the back door, and I had something I would like to continue annually. Uh, I appreciate all the financial advice you guys have given over the years. Thanks in advance. Take care. I see what he did there. Nice one, Pete. Throwing that in. Yeah. What can he do, man? Uh, really, not a whole lot of anything because you had a 401k plan available to you through your employer, then your options for contributing to a deductible IRA are non-existent because you had, well, pretty much non-existent. I'm assuming that you also made money with your employer earnings. And then uh, secondly, because you already took advantage of your IRA contribution limit for the year, which was the backdoor, then that's it. So that's uh, those two things are done off the table. In the future, by the way, if you are done with work and you are going to consider moving your 401k to an IRA, just keep in mind, just like we talked about earlier today, that's going to affect your ability to do backdoor contributions in the future. For the rest of this year, your only other source of tax deferral would be if you were self-employed, if you had a side hustle or if you had a part-time job that ran through a self-employment type of thing, not a W-2, but you have to be you know, your own head cook and bottle washer here. So then you have some deferral options as you are technically your own employer at that point. In total, though, you are still limited in your total contributions to pre-tax plans over the entire year. So even if you contribute the full amount in one job and you have another job, you're going to be limited. You're going to be maxed out already, so to speak. It's a total contribution that you can make in pre-tax plans. And so you'll want to make sure that you work with your tax pro to top that out. But um, that's the only thing that comes to my mind in terms of pre-tax stuff. Awesome and succinct as usual, OG. Thank you, Your Highness. Thanks for the question, Pete. You got a question for the show? You can fly that question on over here. You know, these questions, OG, are a lot like landing a plane. You just turn on your computer. You just press the button, <laughs> the, the make me go down button, make softly me. and gently. And everything just uh, works out. You just buckle in, you leave a message, then you disembark. It's it's very fun. Right. Exactly. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. That gets you to the Haven Lifeline. All right. We got time for one more letter here. It's unbelievable that we're out of time. Our last letter today is just a clarification, OG. Oh, okay. Jamie here wants some clarification. You may or may not have ranted about uh, some Vanguard fund fees. I think well, you did. 
a few months ago. Well, your rant was before my rant. This goes back to that. That's how far behind on letters we got. Jamie says, Hey, just found your pod and loved it. I'm self-employed and do my own investing. My strategies, Vanguard, low cost index funds with an asset allocation I'm comfortable with, which is about 70, 30. Everybody kind of drinks the same. Everybody is, you know, just off by 30%, but that's okay. Everybody's everybody that's written in today is 70, 30. Current age is 44. Last pod, you mentioned Vanguard and sort of sound like you didn't like their method. Is this correct? Or am I doing okay? Thanks. All right. We we just have to talk. You're fine. Yes. The, an- the answer is you're fine. We don't hate Vanguard at all. We very much like Vanguard funds. Use them. Have them. And things are going to be- Own them personally. Vanguard, like other Recommend fund families, them. have some bad funds. But if you're sticking with index, they're index products. There's no such thing as a bad index because an index by definition is going to do what the index does. And there's- Plus minus tracking error. Right. And and there's some of the lowest cost uh, approaches in the industry. So there's maybe three or four fu- other fund families that will have a similar uh, expense profile. And so they're right up there. Nope. Going to be good. That wasn't what our rant was about. Our rant was about something that I saw last week, OG, online. And it was somebody who was saying, well, I saw this strategy and it had a 0.29% expense ratio. And I was that seems pretty expensive. Could I get that down to 0.24? And my head flipped off because the average expense on a fund is closer to, and we just did a story about this recently, is closer to 0.75. And when you get down around 0.29, and by the way, this was a professional strategy by a good analyst that's not managing me personally for somebody. One of the smartest money people in the world. Right, right. And when you're wasting your precious hours of your life to second guess a super low cost strategy, to make it even lower cost versus taking that and running with it and spending your valuable time on doing something which is going to pay you more per hour. That's when I get frustrated because you guys listen to the show. You rock. You're rock stars. And why wouldn't you get paid like rock stars? Stop thinking about four cent decisions. Stop it. Yeah. And that, Jamie, was what our rant was about. With the with that particular question, it wasn't about Vanguard. Vanguard's great. The person was trying to take a They're really good thing. super awesome. We love them so much. Was trying to take a They're super amazing. good thing and make it even better. Don't waste your time on that. Well, nitpicking is what it was. It was, it was. tripping over dollars to pick up pennies. Ridiculous. You know, it's just um, fighting the wrong dragon. What a, you know, it's... Um, It's landing your plane on the wrong runway. It's landing your... Don't do that. (laughs) I know not to do that. I've been instructed very clearly. (laughs) Although, I have an interesting story about this. So, maybe we'll talk about it. Maybe. All right. Later. Not right now, because I'm looking at the clock. Time for us to go. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Thanks, everybody, for the letters. Uh, By the way, thank you to everybody who's left a review of the show. I would tell you what's on Mom's Fridge, but, man, are we behind? That's going to do it for today. Doug, take it from here. What should we have learned today? Well, first, Joe, thinking about becoming a day trader? We're not excited about that, but we are excited about the discipline a good day trader uses when making trades. Create a plan, stick with your plan, and you're much more likely to win with your money. Second, the future of advice? Because of longevity, it's going to be intergenerational. So if you want a great plan, involve parents, grandparents, and kids so that assets flow how you'd like instead of leaving things in disarray. But the big lesson? Don't mention bicycles to Joe's mom because she now wants to go on a bike ride. Bike ride? Can't we just ride in a car or like a scooter? How about just a nice, how about a nice walk down the block, ma? Bike ride. You know what hemorrhoids are like on a bike seat? This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and there's a 73% chance that I played Chuck on Happy Days. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. 
This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Go ahead. Well, thank you for permission to go ahead. <laughs> you were talking about don't land on the wrong runway. So I'm taking flying lessons by, you know, in my free time. For anybody who is listening who is a pilot or has attempted it before, there's a lot of stuff going on. It is 100% stressful for me right now because I have very little time. But I am picking up on things. So we're practicing uh, landings and takeoffs and the takeoffs are fine. The landings are great up until about the last 20 feet. And we're uh, approaching the runway and we get clearance to land on this runway. And we are whatever, three miles away, let's say on the radio. So we're landing. I can't remember the runway numbers, but let's say that we're landing on runway three, three. And on the radio, you hear the tower clear somebody to take off on runway one seven, which you just kind of for a second pause and say, wait a second, <laughs> that is directly into me in three minutes. Like what the F over? And this is in the middle of nowhere. So we called the tower and say, uh, uh, clarification, please. The active runway is three, three. And the guy goes, yeah, but he wanted to take off on runway one seven. So we're going to let him do that. <laughs> <laughs> like I look at my flight instructor, I'm like, uh, uh what do we do now? <laughs> my flight instructor's like, yeah, it'll be fine. I'm like, okay, for the for the record, I disapprove of this. Anyways, so you know. That's just, awesome. just, just there's hey, I thought by flying I would get rid of all the crazy drivers. And you and know, when you drive down the highway, you're like, oh my God, yeah. that person is so crazy in front of me, or they're weaving, or they're playing on their phone. <laughs> nope, it's still the same. It's just you go six times as fast and uh, there's no horn. So you can't like alert anybody. You're like literally flying in a circle and you're like, oh, well, this person seems to be heading right toward me. So I'll turn this way. And then they turn with you and you're like, I, I'm unclear as to what's happening. Why are you following me? <laughs> Why are we playing chicken at 200 miles an hour? You saw a movie. I did. And and I really, I'm looking at the clock and I don't want to do it. But if I don't do this review now, I know this is still in theaters. Some people are wondering whether to see it or not. And we're out next week. Next week, you'll have the Fintern and some of our favorite past episodes. Uh, we call them rewind episodes. So we're not back for two weeks, which means, well, there's a week off and then we're back the week after that, which means I should probably do this now. We'll just make it quick. I saw a movie about a little known singer named elton john not that you're sure if you've ever heard about this guy this movie's called rocket man i could hear the whole tune in my head it was all there i could see all the notes and i just had to get it out it's a little bit funny this feeling inside what did you say your name was again my name is reggie Reginald Dwight. Reginald. That's my granddad's name. So how does a fat boy from nowhere get to be a soul man? You gotta kill the person you were born to be in order to become the person you want to be. I'm thinking of changing my name to Elton. But that's my name. Yeah, I know. Well, you could be the best-selling artist in America if you desire. I was trying to do something bold. Why are you still something flashy? 
Can you even play the piano in those? Let them know who you are. And just don't kill yourself with drugs. And of course, uh, if you know anything about Elton John, you know he goes on to try to kill himself with drugs <laughs> as soon as he gets that advice. This uh, Taryn, Taryn, is it Edgerton? Yep. Edgerton? Yep. The guy from the uh, other cool movies that I actually liked. The Kingsman. I love the Kingsman movies. Uh, I also liked him as Eddie the Eagle. He was great there, too. And you know what's funny? Oh, gee, these, uh, these roles that he plays are all over the place. So when I saw the previews for this movie, I'm like, really? We just had. We just had Freddie Mercury and Bohemian mm-hmm. Rhapsody and Queen. Like, and now I got another one. And I'm just sick of. It's almost. It's becoming that whenever we don't have a superhero movie, we don't have a rock star movie. <laughs> And, uh, 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 yeah, I, I thought no way, but nothing in the theater Tuesday afternoon. It's our tradition. And the last preview that I saw, I thought this looks a little different than I thought. So we went and saw it. Uh, the review is this. I wish I'd seen this before, but he mean Rhapsody because it's better. Mm. I think this is a better movie. It's the same storyline kid from nowhere changes his identity really great in front of a crowd like seriously good in front of a crowd bad management horrible people around them tries to do all the wrong things and then has a period of redemption at the end Ta-da! no spoiler there that's the way all this crap goes <laughs> every single one of these movies goes the same way this one this one follows that completely but boy what a fun ride and you always forget how many great songs somebody like an elton john has had i mean just you know, you're like, yeah, he's had quite a few. And like the you, thing from Lion King. Yeah. And then you go, to, right. Then you go to name them and you name maybe four or five. And then you watch this movie and this two hours long. And they're only doing 15 seconds of a lot of your favorite songs by Elton John. So it's a nice run through Elton John's catalog. It's a great look at Elton John's life. And it's a pretty good story. So uh, big thumb up for Rocket Man. Thought it was a good use of time. Okay. And better, in my opinion, better than Bohemian Rhapsody. And I really like Bohemian Rhapsody. That was a good stuff. So you, you actually can see both of these, and I think you'll appreciate them. <laughs> 